Hello, my name is Dr. Mark Lewis. I am so thrilled to be able to join you on Net Cancer Day. I have a wonderful working relationship with LACNETS that goes back for years, and I was particularly honored that they would ask me to share my perspective on being not just a doctor, but a patient. It's like that uh, old commercial for the hair club for men. I'm not just a president, I'm also a member. Uh, I am very privileged to be a part of the NET cancer community. And while I am going to speak from my standpoint as a patient, I think, and I hope, you'll understand that necessarily at times my doctor self will interject. Uh, I am always a patient first, but I am a physician too, and it's given me sort of two ways of looking at our uh, disease. But again, so um, honored to be with you and happy to share uh, my thoughts. First thing I wanted to say is I did my training, my fellowship in oncology at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. And this man who I'm showing here is a titan in the world of GI oncology. His name was Dr. Charles Mortel. He was a absolute revolutionary when it came to net cancer care. And when I was at Mayo, even though I was there years after he himself had passed away from lymphoma, he was always spoken of with the utmost reverence. And I actually appreciate even more now as a patient what he did than previously when I was just an oncologist. So in 1987, just to show how forward thinking he was, he gave an incredible lecture called An Odyssey in the Land of Small Tumors. And this was all about nets. So he took this platform that he was given at the biggest cancer meeting and used it to shine a spotlight on our illness. And he said some truly remarkable things. If I share his words with you, you'll see he was a gifted writer and a wonderful speaker. And the part in here that I really uh, admire is he was up to the challenge. In fact, he embraced the fact that we are unique. So if you, if you just read some of his words here, he says that we have a natural history of disease like no other. Patients present in an almost serialistic manner a mix of tumor-related symptoms and signs with bizarre and sometimes grotesque endocrine syndromes. Certainly, they are only rarely encountered, but as specialists in oncology, it is our responsibility to understand the less common malignant diseases. The privilege of caring for a patient with a neuroendocrine tumor is one to be savored. And I think you can see why I have so much love and respect for this man. Because in my practice, and I am very lucky to say this, one in four of my patients in my GI oncology clinic have NETS. And to be honest with you, some of my colleagues sort of offline have said, Mark, I don't know how you do it because those NET patients are, are challenging. And what they mean by that is not that our attitude, our demeanor is difficult, but that almost all of us have our own story and require our own management. There is only so far that textbook medicine can get you. Now, one of our problems is, you know, classically we're referred to as, as zebras rather than horses. And, you know, that's an aphorism that needs a little bit of explanation. So in medical training, we are taught as students and then as residents, when you think hoofbeats, think horses, not zebras. And the idea there is, you know, it's appropriate, especially for someone early in their medical career, to really think the most about, you know, the things that are the most common. However, if you only do that, you are going to miss patients like us. And what that leads to, what I'm trying to show you there on the right, is the dramatically different way in which our tumors present depending on where they start. So these colored bars, I know this is kind of an overwhelming graphic at first, each color represents a different symptom that people present with. So for instance, you can see there's wheezing, uh, there's diarrhea, uh, there's flushing. And because it's such a complex mixture of all these signs and symptoms, and because there's so much misdiagnosis that goes on, there are these huge delays, especially at first, from the time of onset of symptoms to correct diagnosis. And you can see there in this particular study, the average length of time was just under five years. There are other studies suggesting it's longer than that. But all of us, I think, on the patient side have had the experience of you know, dealing with something in our own body, knowing something's not right, but not getting the right label. And we'll get into nomenclature in just a second. But I cannot tell you at the other end of that sort of cancer experience, how often people come to me and they've basically been accumulating the wrong diagnosis or the wrong diagnoses as they go. And the, the classic one I'll say is someone who's dealing with carcinoid syndrome 
And just for the purposes of this example, I'll make it say a middle-aged woman. So the flushing gets explained as postmenopausal hot flashes. The diarrhea, which can absolutely be torrential, gets mis-explained as irritable bowel syndrome. And the wheezing gets described as adult onset asthma. And you know, there's only so many times that lightning can strike, right? So we also like the theory uh, or precept of Occam's razor, which says if there's a single explanation for everything, that is scientifically the most appealing. And, and so the problem is with all these different specialists getting involved, you need someone to step back and take a look at the whole picture. And of course, the patient's going to do that, but you also need a doctor who can do that. So why this is even more complicated is the basic terminology that's used. So it, in honesty, we all owe a tremendous debt of gratitude to this man. This is Dr. Siegfried Obendorfer. He was a pathologist in Germany in the very early 20th century. And in 1907, he stared down his microscope, as you can see there, and he published a very important article in a Frankfurt pathology journal, same year. And you can already see some of the words there in German. So when he was looking at these tumors, they did not look to him like traditional cancer, but they also didn't look entirely benign. And he knew he was seeing something new, something sort of bridging two understood cellular phenomena. And so he came up with a word, and it's a word that we might live to regret now. So that word was carzenoid. It was the closest he could get in German to sort of saying that this was cancer-like, but different. The problem is, you know, that gets translated into English as carcinoid or cancer-like, and already we're starting to get just a little bit away from his intent because this is all too easily interpreted as uniformly benign, and that is not a cognate or a match for what Dr. Obendorfer intended, so much so, actually, that by the end of his life, he was sort of trying to retract this, but it's incredible just how anchored that term became, and now, well over a century later, we still have this word, and the reason it's so troublesome is it leads sometimes very well-meaning doctors who are just, you know, very passingly familiar with the phenomenon to think that this is a uniformly benign problem when, of course, we all know it is not. So another peek behind the curtain. In medicine, and specifically in surgery, it's very common to have conferences that we call M and M, and that stands for morbidity and mortality. These are really serious endpoints things that happen to patients. They either are rendered extremely ill or the mortality part, they pass away. And the reason I'm bringing this up here is I really hate the term good cancer. That is such a relativistic way of looking at things. There's almost no cancer that I think the person who says that would really want, even if they consider it to be prognostically favorable. And there again, there's a misunderstanding of just how serious neuroendocrine tumors can be. So Dan uh, Halpern, a great colleague from MD Anderson, did a really excellent study published in one of our journals, Lancet Oncology, several years back, showing, in fact, that if you follow these patients for long enough, and we all know this and fear this, you actually do see um, their survival drop off. And the carcinoid syndrome patients sort of get double jeopardy, where they have slightly shorter life expectancy, and of course, they're more symptomatic. And again, if you take all nets, that's what the curves look like, you can also drill down and look at the traditional carcinoid tumors, the mid-gut tumors that metastasize. And again, you know, these have a, a significant impact on people's life expectancy you know, going out to a decade from diagnosis. So, you know, we underestimate these diseases at our peril. So one of the things that I have become attuned to now that I'm a patient as well as a doctor is all this double speak in oncology. So in oncology, and even my kids have picked up on this, you know, when we say something is negative, we generally mean that is a good thing. It's, it's a good thing to be negative. A test comes back negative, that's generally a better thing. You would think it'd be positive, but no, it's the other way around. And there's some other words too, like progression. In almost every other field, if there is progression, we're moving in the right direction. But in oncology, progression means tumor growth, and we don't want that. We want regression. So that seems backwards. And the final thing that really gets to me is the term survival curves. Those graphics I just showed you are the classic way of plotting how people do over time. So typically you've got a y-axis and an x-axis and the x-axis is some units of time, can be years, can be months. And every time that curve goes down, there are patients dying. And from some of my own writing, I, I just, I still see that when these curves are printed in journals or they're shown on huge screens and oncology conferences, my colleagues who are very well-meaning and are just trying to show objective data, 
you often lose sight of the fact that every single notch downward on the curve is a patient who was lost. And I think, particularly in groups like yours, I think we feel that. I think we know the past members who are no longer with us, and we remember them in a way that, frankly, is a lot more personal and meaningful than these survival curves. Because they're not actually survival curves. They're showing you a drop-off in survival. I think they might be more properly named mortality curves. And again, I'm not here to be a pessimist or to bring you down. I just think it's important that we grapple with the harsh realities of these diseases and we don't underrate their severity. Now time for some uplift and some hope. This is an incredible time to be alive as a net patient. And again, where I started my oncology training was in 2009. And I was actually in fellowship in 2011 and when this incredible day happened, my faculty got very, very excited. And the reason they got excited, if you cast your eyes sort of the middle lower part of this time curve, on the same day, Sunidinib and Everolimus, uh, there were huge articles came out in our biggest journal, the New England Journal of Medicine. And all of a sudden, we had these new pills available for treatment of pancreatic nets. And, you know, this showed that, you know, progress wasn't happening in a predictable or linear fashion. There were sort of these stops and starts. And again, if you look at the, the time along the top, it's not perfectly linear. There are these huge stretches of time where it, feel, it felt like quote, nothing was happening. In fact, what was happening is clinical trials that weren't allowing us to introduce new treatments. And what I see, and I hope you see here, is an accelerating cadence of new approvals, new uses of drugs in neuroendocrine tumors, because just actually beyond where this timeline cuts off is PRRT. Uh, there's also been a very recent publication by Pam Coons et al. in regard to CAPTEM, the combination of capecitabine and temozolamide in treatment of some nets. So this is only getting better and better, and the intervals between our advances are getting shorter and shorter. So no one wants to be dealing with nets right now, but in terms of taking a historical view, this is the best time to be dealing with them because we have the most options. One of the things that I think is difficult to explain to patients, and, and perhaps even um, not all doctors are aware of this, is actually thinking in a rigorous fashion about quality of life is a very recent development when, again, you step back and look at science over centuries. So the very first randomized clinical study, and this is kind of a great story, was way back in 1753. There was a naval captain on a British vessel, and he gave half to sailors on the ship some form of citrus fruit and the other half got uh, placebo or control. And the half that got citrus didn't get scurvy, and the half that got everything else did get scurvy. So a beautiful study proving the importance of vitamin C. So why am I bringing that up? Well, randomization has been a crucial part of how we do studies ever since. Uh, because by randomizing, you can kind of see what's happening by chance and see what's happening because of the intervention that you're trying to study. So if you fast forward, it took over 200 years from that naval study, that scurvy study, until someone actually started asking about quality of life. It was until 1978, as best I can see, was the first time in the literature someone said, you know what, we should actually be asking about and studying quality of life in the same way that we ask about and study length of life. And I'm bringing this up just because when we talk about endpoints in trials, things that we measure, Usually we talk a lot about survival. Sometimes we talk about tumors changing in size, but what we seldom until recently have asked is quality of life. And I'm happy to tell you that net research has been incredibly progressive in the best possible sense of that word and how it thinks about quality of life as I'll show you in a minute. There's a, an even greater, almost philosophical argument here about you know, what matters, what is meaningful in clinical trials. And here again, we can sort of tease apart what might matter to a researcher and then what might matter to a patient. And what we really want, of course, is for those goals to align. So one way of thinking about it is clinical endpoints, again, things that can be quantified, and non-clinical uh, endpoints, uh, surrogates, uh, that may or may not uh, have any sort of clinical uh, correlate. And this was, I think, well put in this paper, clinically meaningful endpoints relate to outcomes which capture how a person, a patient, feels, functions, or survives. This is actually slightly harder to do, especially in a rigorous and reproducible fashion than you might think. I think the two main objectives that both doctors and net patients can have alike is symptom control and disease control. And I thought this was a really well done graphic where the black box and everything to the left of the center line is about symptom control, and the blue box and everything to the right of the line is about controlling tumor growth. 
And you can see that almost every intervention we can perform in nets, whether it's surgical, whether it's somatostatin analogs, whether it's immunotherapy or chemotherapy or targeted drugs, it actually crosses the line and allows us to achieve both, but to varying degrees. And what's really interesting is the history of NET treatments being improved almost always had started with some form of symptom control and then later demonstration of disease control. So we can have our cake and eat it too, but it's really important for both the patient and the prescribing doctor to know what exactly are we trying to achieve with each treatment what sequence should we use, or should it, we at times be combining these treatments? So I think it's really important that we find our way together, and I'll show you why. This is an incredibly complicated uh, pathway, uh, recently published by the European Society of Medical Oncology, or ESMO, which is trying to guide a doctor who may or may not be familiar with NETS sort of through these various sort of flowcharts to arrive at the correct treatment for a patient. And you can see already, it gets very complicated right away, depending on where the tumor started, its proliferative rate, and of course there's various ways of measuring that, and then deciding, okay, do we need to start with some anti-hormonal treatment like a semester and analog? Do we need to jump right into chemotherapy? This is really, really complicated. And I would argue that the layer that needs to go on top of this is how is the patient feeling and what do they want to do? Because at the end of the day, the things that we are most interested in, and this is a mutual interest, are longevity and quality of life. And I always tell my patients that they're really the only ones that can tell me about the latter. Yes, I have lots of tests, lots of ways of measuring what's happening in their body, whether that's a blood test, a urine sample for say 5-HIA, a fancy scan like a PET scan, but at the end of the day, they are the ultimate arbiters of their own quality of life. And it's really, really important that we empower our patients, ourselves, to talk about that. Because oncologists, if I'm honest, we like things that we can measure. We are very scientific. But we cannot forget about the important qualitative aspects of our patients' lives. And that really only has come to medical attention recently. And like I told you, and I'll show you in a minute, the net oncologists and researchers have actually led the way there. I don't know how familiar the patient community at large is with this endpoint, but I can tell you it's very, very important to oncologists. It's called progression-free survival. What it means is, to put it bluntly, being alive uh, without tumor growth. Uh, and again, some of the ways we measure tumor growth, we can uh, maybe say are arbitrary when it comes to nuts. And this was a really interesting analysis published in 2019. I vividly remember hearing this at a conference and thinking, wow, uh, this doctor, Dr. Giawali, really gets it. And what he was saying here is, although it's very tempting for oncologists to put a lot of weight on this metric, progression-free survival, or PFS, it really does not correlate very well at all uh, with quality of life. And so what he's saying there, distilled on all the fancy math, is you can't use progression-free survival as much as we like to measure it as a surrogate, as a predictor of positive quality of life. And so he said, patient's quality of life must be directly measured and cannot be assumed from progression-free survival or surrogate endpoints, or basically accept no substitutes, ask about quality of life. And NETS, we have been doing this, the community, the researchers of NETS have been doing this thankfully for years. So here, this is a paper from actually Dr. Martel, who I mentioned earlier, and Dr. Qualls at Mayo Clinic. This is a paper in 1986, so a year before Dr. Martel's lecture. And what this was showing in, again, our most prominent journal was an improvement in patients flushing diarrhea, and then yes, the quantitative measurement of their serotonin excess when they were placed on a long-acting somatostatin analog. And this is a big, big deal because this is about largely symptom control. And to have that much attention in a major journal shows that Dr. Qualls, Dr. Mortel, and colleagues were already interested in the impact that treatments had on that quality of life. And that, I think, really sets our field apart from other tumor types that even I treat. So, you know, in, in colon cancer, for instance, and in pancreas cancer, it's almost always about survival first and quality of life afterwards. But with NETS, it's really been the other way where we've actually been studying quality of life and then later demonstrating survival benefits. So there's other examples I can cite. So this was when uh, lanreotide, another uh, somatostatin analog, came on the market. And the response rate here is not tumors getting smaller in scan. The response rate here is uh, drops in 5-HIAA. So this, again, is a, a marker of serotonin excess. So to see that come down, meant that patients ought to be getting less symptomatic. Again, the flushing, the wheezing, the diarrhea. And then again, this was a, a relatively recent FDA approval, so teletristat, of course, is a, as an oral medicine, and what it does is tries to cut off serotonin production at the source 
in the nuclei of the neuroendocrine tumor cells. But its approval didn't have anything to do with those tumors getting smaller on skin. It had to do with change in uh, baseline uh, urine 5-HIA and then the effect that that had on the patient's bowel movements. So I know this sounds very odd, but to this audience it won't. Uh, this was a drug that was approved showing that the number of bowel movements that the patients was having in excess per day dropped when they started this medicine. And again, the FDA has all kinds of fancy markers of a drug's effectiveness. Here, this was about how often are people going to the bathroom. And that really matters, right? That's a huge quality of life issue. I have seen patients with serious carcinoid syndrome be rendered unable to work by torrential diarrhea. So these endpoints matter, even if they strike you know, most people and even some oncologists as, as quite unconventional. So in my mind, I tell my patients this all the time in every therapeutic setting, the perfect marriage is we have to do things that are tolerable for our patients and effective for our patients. And if there's any sort of dark history in oncology, it's been looking way too much in that right circle and then forgetting about the left circle and specifically forgetting about the middle of the Venn diagram where you find synergy. Because chemotherapy has famously or infamously been very, very difficult to tolerate, even if it's been quite effective in controlling or shrinking cancer. And that's why oncologists like me, frankly, I don't blame people, we kind of have a bad reputation because we get conflated with these horrible toxicities. But in anything that we do for a net patient, what we really want to be doing is combining these two spheres of influence and finding that sweet spot in the middle. And this actually even involves the scans that we do. So what I wanted to talk about now is my perspective as both an oncologist and a patient about imaging. Imaging has gotten better in the sense that it has more sensitivity, but we need to ask ourselves, is that actually incurring some risk also? So I'm going to use a, a slightly fancy word, which is iatrogenic. You know, that kind of boils down to um, Greek. And, and really what's happening here is, is doctors inflicting harm, even with the best possible intent. And what I'm getting at is when I was in fellowship about 15 years ago, there was a movement to scan patients very frequently. So for instance, if I was following someone, uh, I might be uh, told that I should be doing CT scans on them maybe every three months, maybe indefinitely, or maybe for a matter of years. And CTs are just stacks of x-rays. So each CT incurs a, a significant amount of uh, radiation. And in fact, what you'll see on here, if you look at the, the axis below, is this is from the Nuclear Regulatory Commission in the United States. And largely for people that are working around radioactive substances, there are limits as to how much radiation they can be exposed to in any given year. And basically what you see here is from like an employee safety perspective, if you got five CTs, you would be at the threshold of what our government considers safe in the workplace. So this is not a uh, insignificant amount of radiation that we might be exposing our patients to. So that's why at the top, I'm quoting Othello. So in Othello, he talks about being one that loved not too wisely, but too well. And what he's really saying there about his love for Desdemona is it was very, very strong and passionate, but it sort of led him to be irrational. And that's what I'm getting at is oncologists might be very well-meaning. You might think, oh, we're doing such a good thing to be following our patients so frequently with scans. But the scans are not necessarily benign if this radiation is adding up in people who already have cancer. So that's one thing to keep in mind. The other thing that's a little bit, I think, harder to kind of wrap our heads around, but I think our hearts will resonate, is what is the psychological burden of being able to see more? So the first example I'll give you from our colleagues at Stanford is on the left, the old school Octrea scan, which used a 111 indium as an isotope. And many of us, including myself, may have had an Octrea scan in the past. Nowadays, we have better and better scans, nuclear medicine scans. We call them somatostatin receptor scintigraphy. So one example, or even this might be outdated, is um, a gallium scan, a 68 gallium dota tape PET scan. So you can see here, this is the same patient at Stanford. And you can see that with the imaging, uh, with the dota tape, you get a lot more resolution than you got on the Octrea scan. Now here's the point. That disease that you can see on the right, it was there on the left, it just wasn't visible, okay? And what I'm asking as patients is, what is the impact on us of being able to see more if it causes us more worry? Is it always worth kind of digging this deep? So the other analogy that you know I might talk about in just a second is you know shining a light on, on things is not always uh, a reassuring uh, thing. And just to really drive home the radiation point one more time, 
This is from the, the final analysis of the survival benefit of Lutathera PRT. So this is Dr. Strasberg and colleagues. Of course, PRT, Lutathera, huge leap forward in therapeutic advance, but one that again comes with a non-zero harm in relationship to radiation exposure. So to me, the most threatening part of PRT is the low but appreciable risk of radiation damage to the bone marrow. Okay, we know this happens. As a guesstimate, when I'm talking to my patients, I think the odds of it happening are about one in 50. And I didn't just generate that number arbitrarily, that comes from the Netter one study. You can see there that just under 2% of the patients who got Leothera then developed a bone marrow failure problem uh, in several years after the PRT ended. So my point is, if we're gonna be treating nets and trying to keep people alive from nets, we don't want to be harming them through either diagnostic or therapeutic radiation exposure that leads to some really serious bone marrow problem. Basically, this is pre-leukemia and it can be fatal. So we have to keep that in mind too. So that's the physical aspect of harm. But what about the psychological aspect of harm? So this is where I'm gonna use an analogy from my time in Houston. So I uh, did a lot of my medical training in Houston uh, I went up to Mayo, as I mentioned, and then my wife, who's from Texas, said, we've been here for three winters. Please take me back so I can thaw out. So we went back. And I loved Houston, but Houston has a cockroach problem. Houston is very swampy, and there's lots of roaches. And so here's my tortured analogy. I know you're like, where's this guy going with this? When I lived in Houston, I would walk into my kitchen in the middle of the night, and I would flip on a light. And unfortunately, a little bit too often for my liking, I would see a roach scurry across the floor. And two things there. One is they say if you can see one roach, there are hundreds more that you can't see. And the second thing is, I had a really hard time sleeping after that. But this is my point. That roach was there whether I could see it or not. And my awareness of it is what disturbed me, okay? So once again, we have on the left, old school Atria scan, and on the right, same patient with a more modern Dotatate scan. And here's what I'm getting at, is thankfully in NETS, the bone metastasis, and you can see here, this poor patient's bones are riddled with disease, are very infrequently symptomatic. And so what I'm getting at is how much are we worrying ourselves by being able to see more if it doesn't necessarily have an impact on our prognosis? So what I'm getting at is other cancers when they go to bone, weaken bones so much that you can have what we call pathologic fractures. Your hip, for instance, might shatter with minimal weight bearing. Thankfully, that is a rare occurrence in nets. So my point is just seeing more in the bones that may not be meaningful to your skeleton, but it might mean a whole lot here to your head, it might worry you, uh, and it might weigh on your heart. And so I just wanna keep that in mind as we talk about the potential downsides of our better and better imaging technology. So finally, I'm gonna end as I promised you or warned you I would, and I have to talk about being a patient physician. And I'll point out, I'm always on the front part of that hyphenate. I'm always a patient first. And if anything, it allows me to see my medical practice and my own patients through the lens of my own experience, well, acknowledging that everybody is different. I actually feel profoundly lucky. Uh, I've been given all sorts of professional privileges and courtesies. My uh, wonderful surgeon here, when he performed my Whipple procedure five years ago, actually allowed it to be tweeted. He allowed a social media team in the operating room, and then we were able to broadcast that. And I was enormously honored that he was willing to do that. I've been involved in uh, digital advocacy efforts um, very early in my own uh, experience with a rare tumor syndrome, MEN1. That's where my nets come from. I kind of partnered up with a nurse uh, who I met through the Mayo Clinic and we founded a Facebook group that's still going to this day. So I understand um, maybe a slightly different, uh, from a slightly different perspective than most oncologists that there are these communities like this one that form around rare tumors that are wonderful. They're wonderfully supportive, they're wonderfully educational. Um, and again, a lot of docs don't get to see this side and, and frankly would be a little, I think, fearful um, that they would be seen as outsiders or um, uh, you know, sort of almost being inappropriate if they were to join a patient group if they didn't have an authentic reason for membership. And then I want to talk, and this is going to get very personal, but it needs to, about my life as a parent. I, I love being a dad. Uh, I um, adore my children. But the reason I'm bringing this up is this, again, is an example of um, abstraction and then real life. So when I was in medical school, this is how I was taught autosomal dominant inheritance. What that means is if you have a mutation that causes cancer, you have a 50-50 chance in, in these conditions of passing that on to any one of your children. And what I'm showing you here is the initial pedigree, initial family tree that identified my tumor syndrome, MEN1. Very, very smart doctor in New York, looked at a large family of Italian immigrants and said, well, gosh, 
about half of them, and this is the, the black in shaded squares and circles, about half of them are dying, actually, of really severe stomach ulcers. So this was horrendous. So these people were bleeding to death, or their stomachs were perforating, a horrible way to go. And it was happening to almost exactly half of them. He saw it happening in successive generations. You're going here from top to bottom. And he saw it happening in men and women. So this pattern, this is autosomal dominance, 50-50 chance that an affected parent is going to pass it on to any one of their children. That's how I learned it in the textbook. And this is how I learned it in real life. So I'm going to show you now. These are my kids. So I have two children. So this is going to be a um, perfect example of 50-50. So each one of them had half a chance of um, getting a run from me. It's a, a coin flip. And my daughter, Emma, on the right, uh, does not carry ME and one and my son, Alan, on the left, does. The good news is, so far, you can't tell that by looking at them. And I imagine it's going to be many, many years, I hope, before Alan himself has many, or any, I should say, visible signs of the disease. So what I'm getting at is, especially when we get into inherited cancer risk, this looks completely different to me now as a dad than it did as a doctor. And, you know, to a certain extent, that objectivity, that cold remove is important for doctors to make decisions that aren't too emotionally freighted. But as a parent, I well understand that we would much rather things happen to us than to our children. And it really has changed my perspective completely on uh, medical genetics. And then, you know, Alan, who you saw there, my son, is named after my late father. So this is Alan Lewis. Um, he passed away when he was 49 years old. And although he didn't know it at the time, he had ME1. So he died of neuroendocrine tumors. And it's impossible for, for me not to look at the progress chart that I showed you earlier and sort of wish um, wistfully that my dad had lived to see some of that same progress. And, you know, I say this knowing that this group in particular has um, lost people. It's lost incredibly important um, advocates like, like Giovanna. And I, I know this is going to resonate with the people that listen to this. So as much as I'm optimistic, I also realize that we got this far, uh, unfortunately, not being able to help everybody along the way. Now, my dad had a remarkable perspective. You know, he died young, and he wrote this incredible book, actually, while he was going through chemotherapy, and his attitude continues to inspire me. So rather than saying, why me? He said, much more realistic is the question, why not me? Why should I be exempt from the floods and famines, accidents and disasters that bedevil my brothers and sisters? By what extra extravagant mercy have I so far survived that to which so many others tragically succumb? The grounds for gratitude multiply. Spine tingling miracles of providential timing, the banter and much laughter that frequently echoed through my valley of darkness, the discovery with family and friends of whole new levels of resourcefulness and love, and the opportunity now, however brief or lengthy, to discard the trivial and the shallow and to fill every moment in relationship with meaning, intensity, and value. Now, my father died in 1994, never sent an email, certainly could not have envisioned all the wonderful virtual communities we have now, including this one, including this means of communication. But his attitude, I think, is sort of evergreen, this notion that you know, again, none of us would have chosen to have nets. And I realize that I actually, my experience with nets is far more um, favorable and has been more tolerable than, than many of my patients. And I know I'm lucky even within this community. But I just so admire his selflessness, the realization that there are many, many afflictions in this world. And um, you know, if we are net patients, um, yes, we have to bear a burden. Uh, but we also have some perspective on how our um, disease looks relative to at least some other cancers. And uh, that's kind of a note of sort of um, perspective that I wanted to end on. Uh, so with that, I thank you enormously for having me. Uh, it really is a, a, a real a rare privilege, actually, to be able to talk more as a patient than as a doctor, although, of course, I had to do both. Um, when I was at Mayo Clinic, I had a, a car accident that could have been fatal. Uh, someone rear-ended me. I was paused, stopped on the highway for another accident. This person went into me at 60 miles an hour, spun me completely around. My car was totaled. I walked away without a scratch. And I said on that day, you know what? Worry is a use of energy that I should better put other places. And I'm not saying I don't get down or anxious sometimes, but the short-term risk of just driving my car far outweighs right now the long-term risk of posing uh, posed by my nets. And, and I try to keep that in perspective too. Uh, and then just as a reminder, I, I do understand what it's like to be a patient. I try to remind my colleagues not to minimize the impact, the side effects of treatments, whether that's medical or surgical. You can see here I've got a, an NG tube in my nose after my Whipple. That tube stayed in place for five weeks. And so every time I take a breath through my now open nostrils, 
I don't take it for granted. And I know that many of you listening have had experiences that, that make you sort of newly aware of just how grateful we should be when our bodies do work, but also make our doctors aware that these treatments are not easy and it is okay. In fact, it's appropriate uh, that we share our stories, share our experiences, and support one another. So on that note, thank you so much for having me. A real honor again to speak, not just as an oncologist in a white coat, but as a human being, as a dad, uh, and uh, as a son. So thank you.